Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Shatak Ratu Sahu. I am a senior research analyst and senior program manager in the technology and society research program at Carnegie India. I have co-authored a paper on India's advance on AI regulation with my colleague Amlan Mohanty, who's a non-resident research fellow at Carnegie India. And in this video clip, I will attempt to uh, illustrate and describe uh, the key takeaways from the uh, working paper. So why we wrote this paper is that uh, in India, there is nothing that really describes India's advance comprehensively, which highlights the views of different stakeholders and which provides a policy pathway ahead. So this paper tries to do that. This paper tries to do, uh, do two things, as I said. One is to capture the sentiment of different stakeholders. And secondly, very broadly, provide policy pathways. So in terms of methodology, my colleague Amlan and I interviewed about 17 people. These were detailed interviews off the record anonymous across government officials, industry representatives, uh, technologists, lawyers, so on and so forth. And we coupled this with our discussion, with our discussions in closed door settings with multi-stakeholder participants um, and a broader group discussing the issue. And also we've attended public sessions on the issue of AI regulation. And finally, we uh, read up the literature on the topic on AI regulation in India and AI regulation in, in world over. So put this pa paper across. Uh, so the first section actually talks about the sentiment analysis across industry, government, and civil society. And a lot has happened across these stakeholders, uh, through these stakeholders uh, in terms of what their views are. But very broadly, uh, there's agreement that India does not need a separate new AI law. Secondly, there's agreement across stakeholders that existing laws apply to AI. Thirdly, there is broad agreement that we can encourage self-regulation to begin with. And lastly, we may need some targeted regulation for specific issues. However, there are some, some disagreements as well across these three stakeholder groups. First is what is the nature of AI risk, especially in the Indian local context. Secondly, while we say that existing laws can apply uh, to AI risks and AI harms, we do not accurately understand what those gaps are in the existing Thirdly, while self-regulation could be beneficial, we don't know if self-regulation by itself is sufficient or for how long should we go on with self-regulation. Third, that if, if we need targeted regulations and we're not sure what the scope and timing of these targeted regulations should be. So we've approached this paper from first principles and we've identified three points basically. Why should we regulate any technology in the first place? Or why should we regulate any issue in the first place? It's, it's, it's to address market risks and failures through a system of rights and obligations. Secondly, what should we regulate when it comes to AI? We need to focus on inputs, outputs, processes, and specific issues. And we have to be very careful that we don't regulate the underlying technology itself. It's broadly because in AI is a general purpose technology. It has cross-sectoral applications. And therefore, you need to focus on specific issues. What uh, data is being used to train large language models, or how is data is being how data is being processed by those large language models, or the outputs like what are the AI products out there and what good or bad they do. Thirdly, whom do we regulate? For this, we need to have an accurate understanding of the AI value chain. There are developers, deployers, users, so on and so forth. But so we need to have a better understanding of the AI ecosystem. And then you can map any obligations onto these entities once you have a better understanding of the entities. So once we know why we need to regulate, that's to address market risk and failures through a system of rights and obligations. And secondly, when we know what to regulate, which is basically inputs, outputs, and processes, and specific issues with regards to AI, and not the underlying technology. The third and the last critical part is whom to regulate. And here... We need to understand the AI value chain better. There are, there are developers, there are deployers, there are users, and there are some other entities. Then in this paper, we've actually unpacked the relationship between risks and harm, because that is important to understand the phrase risk-based AI regulation. Different jurisdictions talk about risk-based AI regulation. However, there's a need to understand what do we mean by risk and what do we mean by harm. Risk is the probability of an occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. Risk is forward-looking. And harms are basically evidence-backed events, which are, which are backward looking or which look towards the past. The problem in India is that there are many AI harms, but uh, there is no clear-cut uh, or, or a rational categorization of AI risks. For example, there are privacy harms. Uh, there is malicious use of AI, for harm, which creates harmful content, which may impersonate someone. Uh, thirdly, there are cybersecurity risks, so on and so forth. However, uh, there is a lack 
of uh, evidence of those harm in the Indian context and there is a lack of a risk classification framework. In this paper, we have uh, identified five risks which, uh, which can be adopted by Indian policymakers such as malicious uses, algorithmic discrimination, transparency failures, systemic risks and loss of controls. So under these five different buckets of risk classification, you can identify different harms after they've been identified with their so under this under these five categories of risks you can uh, plug in the different uh, harms with their evidence with us and then you can uh, have the uh, and then you can identify some high risk cases along these five vectors the third part is that uh, as i spoke earlier different stakeholders agree that existing laws apply uh, to ai risks so here we need to apply existing laws and then we need to understand the gaps in those existing laws and after we do that, it will be useful if the courts and tribunals of the country apply AI risks to the existing laws to further see, to further elaborate on the gaps. Because in theory, the gap could be somewhere, but when the court interprets the gaps, it may look different or it can shed more light on the regulatory gaps or the harms or risks itself. Here, it's important that it should be geared towards uh, three action points. One is where no regulation would be required. We understand that uh, there are some AI risk, quote unquote, risks which may not need any new regulation. For example, job displacement. Job displacement, we understand, is a risk which can be addressed through policy measures, let's say, of upskilling or, uh, or reskilling initiatives, or artificial general intelligence, which at this moment for a country like India is not a very high priority issue because we're trying to leverage AI on a pro innovation. Secondly, we may need some targeted amendments. There are some laws already on, on the legal books. Uh, there are some provisions already on the legal books. And these, those can be applied to AI harms and AI risks, but they may need some clarification. For example, deep fakes. The issue of deep fakes can very well be addressed through existing laws of the IT Act or the Bharatiya Nyaya Samhita, but they may need some tweaking and some clarifications. Similarly, copyright exceptions could be one another case where the courts can just clarify how the existing laws apply. To, to copyright uh, exemptions or copyright violations. Thirdly, we need to identify places where we need new regulations. These, these regulations to uh, have transparency obligations for uh, algorithmic accountability. So here we need to identify high risk cases which would mean new laws. So once we've understood uh, what the AI risks are and hopefully we've gathered evidence of harm for those AI risks and then we do a gap analysis of existing laws then we need to approach approach the issue through different regulatory models here on offer is firstly the self-regulatory approach these are basically voluntary commitment self-certification mechanism etc many a times there are market incentives for self-regulation uh, one benefit another benefit is that uh, it can coexist self-regulation can coexist with other models of regulation however there are some disadvantages such as there's conflict of interest and there's a lack of industry and government uh, there's a lack of government industry trust uh, self-regulation can be found in the examples of the united states where there were voluntary commitments in the year 2023 in uk where uk published a white paper on pro-innovation approach to ai of regulation through some principles uh, and then japan is also looking at self-regulation self-regulation there is a co-regulatory mechanism where Basically, the government endorses industry actions. Codes of practice can be drafted collaboratively by the government and the industry, and then the industry can follow it. There could be better accountability in this case of co-regulation because the state is involved. It can reduce the burden on the state when the industry is taking care of. It's regulating itself in a co-regulatory fashion, and the government need not direct it towards regulation. Conceptual clarity lacking in India when it comes to co-regulation. There have been issues where uh, in the gaming uh, domain, uh, online gaming domain, some uh, some organizations have been called self-regulatory organizations, but those have been proposed by the government. So technically, th those are co-regulatory organizations. Uh, secondly, there are some uh, structural issues in terms of uh, independence of these uh, quote-unquote co-regulatory bodies, uh, which need, needs to be solved. And finally, there are some implementation details. Sometimes when, when the industry comes up with these co-regulatory models or co-regulatory co-regulatory organizations, the government does not accept it to, for it to begin its practice. One example of co-regulation could be the EU's recently announced codes of practice. Thirdly, uh, there's binding regulation. Binding regulations are legally enforceable with accountability objectives. We believe right now it's premature for India to, approve, to adopt uh, binding regulation 
uh, because we need a first, firstly, we need a comprehensive risk assessment. We need to understand what is the regulatory gap uh, in terms of application of existing laws to AI risk. And thirdly, we do not know the economic cost of binding regulation as that could be very high. Uh, in, for example, in the case of EU AI Act, the European Commission had a report out which said that uh, the cost of uh, regulation could be anywhere between 1.6 billion euros to 3.3 billion euros. To know more about AI and AI regulation specifically, please find a, a hyperlink uh, below and please go through it to explore uh, inputs, our analysis and our recommendations in detail on the topic. Thank you.